pray a sin. We got some good stuff to cover today. And uh, I'll just, I'll pray a sin first. Father, we love you. And I thank you that you are ministering your truth to our heart today. I believe there's a sweetness of the spirit of God in this place. Lord, and whether we're aware or not, sometimes we're aware, sometimes we're not aware, but you are truly moving in this place. It's not just cliche. You are doing something special, Lord, in the heart's of those who are here and also those who are watching by live stream, I'll reiterate that the same spirit, the same anointing is working on them right now. And I believe that as the word goes forth, it is an incorruptible seed that does not return void, but it always accomplishes that which you sent it forth to accomplish. We prepare our hearts to receive and cultivate that incorruptible seed. I thank you that as the word goes forth, it's received not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God that works effectively in those who believe. I pray that as the word goes forth that, that it's the heart of the Father that's expressed, the person of Jesus is unveiled and the Holy Spirit is the teacher and communicator. So we exalt you, we praise you, we glorify you in Jesus' name, amen. If any cross culture or crossover are still in here, you can head on back to your service, enjoy your time and I will see you in four hours. Amen. I would like to acknowledge, too, before I start, uh, the presence of a really dear friend of ours, Jonathan Jardon. He's here from Guadalajara. So you guys give him a hand. He is, he is part of my in-laws church, which is really a, a, another home church for Dora and me. It's Nueva Vida in Guadalajara. He's been a huge blessing to my in-laws. Uh, my my father-in-law, of course, has gone to be with Jesus as of a few months ago, but man, Jonathan and his whole family served my father-in-law. Uh, they just have hearts of servants uh, unlike any I've ever seen. And he also has served alongside Mazare and gone to Sierra Leone a number of times. He's actually here for her event that's happening on Saturday, which I guess was announced. Um, I didn't hear the announcement, but anyway, it, it was announced. And so anyway... My mic's shifting on me a little bit. But Jonathan's here for that, and so we're really blessed to have him. He's a great man of God, and just having his presence here is, is, is real meaningful for us. And I'm not doing a nugget today because I'm giving the message. However, I am doing a nugget. There's something that the Lord, this is not part of my message, but man, I was meditating on this, and it's just good. So it's, it's free this is not my message for today, but I want to invite you real quick to join me. We'll just call this my nugget. Is that okay? Let's go to Psalm 9. And I, I, the Lord was speaking something to me from the introductory statements of the ninth Psalm. You'll see that a lot of Psalms will give the details of the circumstance under which they were written. Sometimes they'll mention the particular psalmist, whether it was David or the sons of Korah or Asaph. And then it'll sometimes mention that David was hiding in the cave or he was in the wilderness of Judea. It'll say it was a miktam of David or something of that nature. So there's a lot of psalms that have these introductory statements that actually aren't part of the content of the psalm itself. And most Bibles include those introductory statements. And this is one, Psalm chapter nine. It starts out, it says, to the chief musician, everybody see that? Well, you don't, I'm sorry, you don't have to say it. I was just asking, do you see it? But if you said it, that's even better. All right. <laughs> To the chief musician, that would be Israel's equivalent of Jessica, okay? And then it says, to the tune of death of the son, a psalm of David. Man, that sounds morbid and awful, doesn't it? So if, if, if this were an official nugget, I would call this nugget, name that tune, okay? The name of the tune is death of the son. And a lot of Bibles, I, I was actually looking through a, a whole list of English Bibles online and Spanish Bibles. I regularly do that, uh, compare translations, and I do it both English and Spanish. And a lot of Bibles don't know what to do with this introductory statement. Uh, some people uh, put the, 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 just put it in Hebrew. I think it's like mutlaben or something of that nature. And so they, they think it's maybe it's someone's name, but they don't want to put death of the sun. That just sounds awful, right? That's not an uplifting song title. Let me tell you something, if our worship team ever came in and said, we're gonna praise the Lord, come on, stand, we're gonna sing our first song, it's called Death of the Sun. A lot of people would be turned off immediately. But that was the tune to which David wrote Psalm 9, okay? And again, a lot of Bibles 
just put the Hebrew phrase. Some Bibles try to clean it up a little bit and put something that sounds more palatable. But if you look into the etymology of what the title of this tune means, it means death of the sun. Well, I'm sure that even Israel wouldn't know what to do with that. Why would you call a song and, and David, King David writes a psalm and the title of it is death of the sun? But let me tell you something. I believe that the realities of what's described in Psalm 9, particularly we'll get down to, to verse 13, Look at verse 13. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my trouble from those who hate me. You who lift me up from the gates of death. See, we should have ended up at the gates of death. Do you know the only thing that has delivered us from the gates of death? The death of the son. A couple of y'all got it. The death of the son. The death of the son of God. His, His redemptive, vicarious suffering. His death It was the death of the son that set us free from the gates of death. And so the tune to which Psalm 9 was written, the tune was called death of the son. And for some reason, the Holy Spirit ensured that that detail was recorded for us where a lot of people don't. I've heard rumors about hymns, and I think think they're true, but hymns that were actually written, that the lyrics were reworked, and they were written to the tunes of old, old bar tunes. You guys have heard about that? Like old bar tunes that they just reworked the lyrics and turned them into hymns that go into hymnals? Well, that's not something that the Baptist church, the Methodist church, but they don't announce their original title. Are you with me? You wouldn't open a Baptist hymnal and say, turn to number 99 in your hymnals. And we're gonna read this is to the tune of 99 bottles on the wall or whatever it is. Like, to the tune of my girlfriend left me or whatever. Nobody announces the original title. They don't tell you. They just sing the new hymn and it's been redeemed, thank you, Jesus. Why would you tell people the original title? Well, this Psalm 9 was written to the tune of death to the son, or death of the son, rather. Death of the son. But the Holy Spirit wanted us to see that detail because the realities of, for example, this verse 13 Have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my trouble from those who hate me, you who lift me up from the gates of death. There would never be a way for us to be lifted up from the gates of death were it not for the death of the Son. So thank you, Jesus. That's good stuff, amen? All right, well, now we can get into the message. I just had to get that out of my system. I was meditating on it. I thought it was good, and I thought I'd let you in on it. Is that all right? So today's message, that wasn't it, But today's message is more of a continuation of what we heard from Pastor Paul Kayanja last week. Uh, I was really stirred by his message. Anyone enjoy Pastor Kayanja last week? Yeah? I just thought his message, I thought his message was fire. We were super blessed by uh, the recognition that he gave us and my parents. And man, they're just a wonderful family. And so, boy, his message really stirred my heart. I did tell him, and for you, if you weren't here last week, or you didn't hear the message, you won't get the reference I'm about to make. But I did tell him, I said, listen, and I was very sincere, I meant it. I said, anytime your family decides to go on a fast together, call us and we'll join in with you. We'll fast with you. You don't have to kill your chickens. But we, <laughs> some of y'all know what that means. But anyway, uh, I meant it. I told him, we'll, we'll fast We can be in the same spirit from afar. But man, his message stirred my heart. And he talked about five pillars. Do you guys remember the five pillars he talked about in your relationship with the Lord? He was talking about God is good, right? God is able. God is willing. God sees and God hears. You remember that? That was what he addressed. And so I'm not going to give a summary of everything he talked about, but those were the five pillars. He was teaching from... The revelation about David's mighty men, where they started in that place of being indebted, being discontent in that place, and then where they ended up being David's mighty men, that there were warriors and, and great men of God who did mighty exploits. But he said that what got them to that place of being great men of God were those five pillars, right? And so what were they again? Let's say them again. This is what Pastor Kayanja taught us. It was God is good, God is willing, God is able, God sees, and God hears. So I want to dovetail off of his message from last week, and this is what the Lord put in my heart for today. I had something different in my heart, but that changed, which regularly happens to me, and so this is going to dovetail from his message. We're going to talk about the God who sees and hears, 
And we're going to do that emphasizing the story of someone, a figure from Scripture that you really don't hear a lot of messages about, Hagar. So I'm going to be teaching on the story of Hagar. In fact, I almost called this message Insights from the Story of Hagar, but then I figured people scrolling through our YouTube channel wouldn't stop there. They would just keep scrolling. Who wants to hear the story of Hagar, right? Very few people teach the story of Hagar. I have a very soft spot in my heart for Hagar, particularly because of the interaction that she had with Almighty God. The, Lord, the Lord's dealings with her, the two times that she was cast out into the wilderness, particularly there were Genesis 16 and Genesis 21. We're gonna go through those together, the story of Hagar. But I've had the opportunity to teach the story of Hagar in a number of places where we've traveled, uh, more than I've done it here in the church, but we've gone, let's, I remember when we were in Kenya, I was teaching, they invited us both, Dora and me, to speak in a women's conference. And so in that women's conference, most of what I taught was from the story of Hagar. And man, the women were lit on fire as they heard the word, different revelations concerning the story of Hagar. And then last year, it was last August, Dora and I were in Mexico. And we went to a number of centers of, of rehabilitation. And one of the houses we went to, um, it's, it, it's called Vidas and Rescate. Jonathan knows about these places. And um, he's gone to minister in some of these places with my father-in-law. So we've gone, and, and man, these are, are rehab centers that are, they emphasize the word of God uh, more than any, I mean, they just, they, they, they set people free with the word of God. And so one of the houses is all women. It's predominantly, their, their house is for men, but there's one that's all women. And so Dora and I went to minister in all of them, and we went to the one for women. And I didn't know what I was gonna teach going in, but the Lord directed me to teach on Hagar and teach redemption through the story of Hagar. And so I did, and I saw women weeping and crying and receiving, being set free. And I, the reason I say all this by way of introduction is just to say there is a lot of depth to mine from the story of Hagar. Now, if we were to talk about Hagar and Ishmael, right? If I just bring up the names Hagar and Ishmael, what comes to your mind? You don't really think about profound revelations at all. You just think about Abraham's mistake, right? Okay, nice try, Abraham. Let's, let's try again. You, 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 you fouled up. In fact, we even talk about creating an Ishmael. We have that phrase in the body of Christ. You ever people say, don't create an Ishmael, which is true, what people mean by that is don't jump out ahead of God, try to do it your own way with your own intellect, your own reasoning, and then you end up creating something that was not how God designed it. You took a word from God and made a paragraph out of it. And, and so that phrase, creating an Ishmael, is well applied. But my point is that when we say Hagar and Ishmael, most people think of Abraham's mistake. And then you'll hear a lot of people that talk about the, the, the age-old conflict between, Abra, uh, between Isaac and Ishmael. You ever hear people talk about that? Right, that, oh, now we've got the Jews and the Arabs and they're still, they're still at, at odds, they're still fighting because that legacy of a Abraham's mistake, it just carries on. And, and, and Ishmael is still there as a thorn in Isaac's side and it just continues. And, and these are people that think they're flaunting Bible knowledge. But let me tell you something. Did you realize that throughout Israel's history, and this is all introduction help me jesus but this is good throughout israel's history did you know that their primary enemies were actually not ishmaelites now there was some conflict regarding ishmaelites but actually their primary enemies were many of them other abramic peoples and then others that were canaanites or or, or from other uh, other lines but their primary enemies were actually not ishmaelites a lot of them were descendants of Esau. So if we, we, there were some, the Moabites were descendants of Lot, right? The Ammonites were descendants of Lot. The Edomites, they were descendants of Esau. And the Amalekites, you guys ever remember talking about the Amalekites, right? They were the ones that, that attacked Israel from behind and, and, and ambushed them as they were coming out of Egypt. And they were a, a constant thorn in Israel's side all the way to the days of King Saul when, when Samuel said, wipe them out, with King Agag. So... The Amalekites, they were a constant enemy for Israel. Do you know where they came from? They were descendants of Esau. And guess who Esau is? Esau was a son of Isaac. So these are actually enemies of Israel that were from Isaac, not from Ishmael. 
just play with your grasp of biblical history, theology, anything. These were enemies of Israel from Isaac's line, not from Esau's line. Or excuse me, from Isaac's line, not from Ishmael's line. Then there was also the Midianites, right, in Gideon's day. Those were also big enemies. They came from another son of Abraham. Remember, Abraham had more sons than just Isaac and Ishmael. After Sarah died in Genesis 25, Abraham remarried a woman named Keturah, okay? Anyone that sits on the front row, if I say Keturah, you're gonna get spat upon. But Abraham's second wife, Keturah, and he had a number of sons with her, and then he sent them off to the east. Well, one of those sons was the progenitor, of the father of the Midianites, who were the big enemies of Israel in the days of Gideon. So those were also an Abrahamic people, okay? But then you had the Philistines who were unrelated. You had Canaanites, Jebusites, Perizzites, termites, I think even, right? They got into the wood of the, hey, forget it. So my point is, is that throughout Israel's history, people that make all these claims about, oh, the age-old conflict between Isaac and Ishmael, it's a really uninformed statement because Ishmael was not really the big issue. In fact, you know why the descendants of Ishmael continue to exist today? It wasn't because God wanted to leave a thorn in Isaac's side or in Israel's side. The reason the descendants of Ishmael still exist today is because Ishmael was also blessed. <gasps> Did I just offend anyone? Did I just upset your theology? Man, if you really wanna be upset, you should go to Isaiah 19 and read how God talks about Egypt and Assyria. My people, the work of my hands. I mean, that'll really offend you. The reason Ishmael's descendants are still around, what happened to all of other, the other, where are the Moabites today? Where are the Ammonites today? Where are the Amalekites today? Where are the Philistines today? There are none. But the Ishmaelites are still around. Why? Because Ishmael was blessed, not because God was trying to leave reminders of Abraham's mistake. Okay? See, here's the deal. Did Abraham make a mistake? Yes. But when God redeems a mistake, the mistake is really redeemed. You don't have to live with the thorn of it in your side for the rest of your life just so God can remind you, you messed up. What kind of God do you think we serve when people are like, well, look, at, look what Abraham did and we're still paying for it today. I'm sorry, but that's ignorance. The reason the Ishmaelites, the, the, the descendants are still around is because Ishmael was also blessed. Jesus loves the Arabs. Now what are we gonna do? I'm sure a lot of people are upset right now. Man, some of the nicest people I've met are Arabs, they're Muslims. They just need Jesus like anyone else. Anyway, I don't need to stay there all day, but I could. But man, you, you need to fix your paradigm if, if you have a problem with what I'm saying right now. If, if, if it, what I'm saying offends you, I don't care. God, God, listen, God didn't ask you. Just like God didn't ask Jonah if he could forgive the Ninevites. God didn't have to clear it with Jonah before he loved the Ninevites. And he doesn't have to clear it with you before he loves the Arabs or anyone else for that matter. <gasps> Man, what, I don't know what's going on with me today, guys. I'm sorry, <laughs> but this is good stuff. It's good stuff. And man, there are some Arab believers in Christ that are some of the most radical, on fire world changers that I've ever seen. And so anyway, I could stay there for a long, long, long time. But you'll see that Ishmael was blessed. Now, it is true that Abraham made a mistake. There's no question about that, okay? And it's also true that Ishmael, even though he was blessed, the covenant blessing was with Isaac. Okay, none of that is, is wrong. In fact, the Apostle Paul emphasizes that greatly in the book of Galatians and even draws a bit of value in an allegorical sense from that story. Okay, so yes, it is true that Ishmael, though he was blessed, the covenant blessing did not pass through him. But even if you take Isaac and subdivide, Isaac had Jacob and Esau, and the Lord said, Isaac, excuse me, Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. I can give explanation for what that means. I'm not gonna do it in this message. But no statement like that was ever made about Ishmael. Esau's descendants, there's, there's no people group that come from Esau anymore, but the Ishmaelites are still around and that's because of the blessing. I, I say all of that to say that I wanna change your paradigm, I wanna change your perception because when we look at Hagar today, we're gonna see, his, we're gonna see the Lord's heart for the outcast, okay? So we're gonna look at Hagar, we're gonna unpack her story, we're gonna see God's heart for the outcast 
And we're also gonna have this encounter along with her with the God who sees and hears, okay? So we're gonna jump into her story together and, and we're gonna have her encounter together with her and, and, and experience the God who sees and hears and watch the impact it made on Hagar, okay? But I wanted to open up and give you that, that, that paradigm shift of sorts because you need to understand this misconception that Abraham made a mistake. It's true, he made a mistake, but that he's, it, oh, we're still paying for it today in the Arab and Israeli conflict. It's still happening because of Abraham's mistake. No, 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 no. You need to change your thinking. You need a paradigm shift because you, we don't serve a God who redeems your mistakes but leaves the reminder around to make you suffer. I'm gonna redeem your mistake, but I'm gonna make sure you never forget it. And it always causes you issues the rest of your existence. No, that's not how God works. God could have easily wiped out Ishmael's descendants, but he loves them and he had blessed them and that's why they're still here. All right, did I stay on that too long? Did that bless you guys? Did that confuse you guys? Do you have to go back and relearn everything now? Let's go to Genesis 16. And so not all of this will be from... Hagar's perspective. Uh, we're gonna look at the narrative as a whole and so some of it we'll, we'll, we'll look at Abraham and Sarah and at the time Abram and Sarai. Uh, we'll look at their perspectives as well. So let's just go through this together. We'll start in Genesis 16 verse one. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. And so Sarai said to Abram, see now now listen to Sarai's words. This is Sarah. Sarai said to Abram, see now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. I don't want to stay on this point too long, but did you notice Sarai's, Sarah's misconception about God? That God has withheld something good from me. It's God's fault that I haven't born children. Well, there was timing Right, It had to happen. The Bible says he was gonna come at the appointed time. Right, The Lord even told when he spoke to Abraham later and he said next year at this time, at the appointed time, at the time of life, that's when Sarah's gonna conceive. So it did have to be at the right time. But the right time, did, or, or, or the, 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 the time in question was not an indicator that God was withholding anything good. You never need to have the misconception that God's withholding something good from you. And Sarah's idea was that God's restrained me. For whatever reason, God doesn't want me having kids. And so these are her words to Abram. So I said to Abram, see now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall, the word here, bana, be built up. I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice and all, and all the problems began, okay? She heeded the voice of Sarai. Somebody, yeah, your GPS is gonna get you there. Don't worry. So I'm just having fun. All right, so Sarai heated, or excuse me, Abram heated the voice. We don't see him putting up a fight. Now, I'm not trying to speculate. I'm just saying Abraham, I'm just kind of, you read the narrative and you get the idea that Abraham just kind of dumbly said, okay. Right. But I want to I wanna give attention to one point, though. When Abram, it says Abram heated the voice of Sarai, not only, I believe, not only did he heed her voice in terms of her suggestion of what he ought to do, but he also, I believe, heeded her voice in terms of, for the present moment, what claims she had made about God. We don't see Abram correcting what she said about God. I want you to think about that. When she said, God has restrained me, the Lord has restrained me from having children, so go into my maid. Abram just collectively heeded her voice to that whole statement and I don't believe that just means he heeded her in terms of what he needed to do that was part of it because obviously we know what he did but he also I believe accepted as truth what she said about the Lord now later the Lord fixed that perception right in in the dealings that Abram had with the Lord later when his name was changed and Abram learned about covenant and but at this time we don't see Abram trying to correct Sarai and say, no, the Lord, this isn't God's fault. The Lord didn't hold you back. No, I believe Abram agreed with her. So this is wrong thinking about God. Never assume that God is withholding something good from you. Because when you do that, you start making ill-informed decisions. Now that was better than you responded. 
I want you to think about it. Maybe, maybe your wheels are trying. Now, and I'm not saying this to get a huge amen corner and rah, rah. What I'm trying to do is I want, I, want to get, I want to get you thinking, okay? The moment you start believing lies or misconceptions, no matter how subtle about the Lord, you will begin to make ill-informed decisions. Because now we've gone on the, you know, no, I don't want your response now. I don't want any sympathy amens. <laughs> you missed your chance. So I, 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 the moment you hear the Lord say, like, people that are first-time visitors, like, is he serious? This guy's intense. So the, the point is, when, when they had their misconception about God, this idea that he's withheld something good from us, for whatever reason, the Lord has kept us back from having a child, well, then they made their decisions from there based on incorrect information and believing a very subtle lie about God. So it is a big deal what you believe about God and his heart and his nature and his character. Because what you believe will give way to what you're gonna do and the decisions you make and the choices you make. And so this, this action, this move that they made, and this is where we don't see Abram putting up any fight or any resistance, and I made that statement earlier, but collectively the two of them together made a decision based on misinformation about God. That's why you need to use wisdom, you need to have a discerning heart, and not make any decisions based on a misconception or a misunderstanding about the God you serve. That's rich. And it's absolutely true. Now let's read on. So verse three, then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Interesting, it doesn't say concubine. She was given to him at the level of wife. You know, I should not bring this up. I already know it before I'm doing it. Forgive me, Lord, for I know what I'm doing. So I... I some of you guys will remember Willie. We loved Willie. This is his chair. It's got a little plate on it. And uh, we were in a Bible study one time, and Willie was talking about this story of Abraham, Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, and he knew the word really well. But anyway, Willie made the observation. He said, look, Abraham was uh, supposed to have a son with Sarah, and instead he wound up with a concubine, but he didn't say concubine. He said porcupine. And anyway, that brought about so much laughter that the Bible study had to, it was tough to get us back on track. So anyway, man, I love Willie, I miss Willie. So, Hagar's brought in not as a concubine or porcupine, she's brought in as a wife, okay? Now, one thing that, one thing that this does have in common with a porcupine is this situation did become a thorn in Abraham's side. <laughs> It, yeah, this was a sticky situation. We, we, we could keep this going all day. We could milk that one. So anyway, let's go on in verse three. It says, he gave her to, she gave her to Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar and she conceived. Now here's, this is a big one here. She conceived and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Now this I'm going to say a lot of good things today about Hagar. I'm going to talk about her good heart and the Lord's heart for her. But this was wrong. The way Hagar re responded to having conceived, uh, Hagar handled this in a very bad way. Because it says that when she recognized that she had conceived, it says her, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Now, the Lord wants to make you fruitful. Okay? He wants you to bear fruit. But... And, and, and think about this. What she conceived was the seed of Abraham. It wasn't the seed of Abraham, but it was a seed of Abraham. And so she's conceived, but watch this. Even when the Lord grants you conception and you, your life starts becoming fruitful, that, that fruitfulness of, of what's happening in your life should never be occasion for you to despise anyone else, especially those who are in authority over you. And I've seen people that, man, once their life starts bearing fruit and they're thinking, man, look at what's happening in my life, look at what I'm accomplishing, forgetting that you would not have conceived were it not for the seed being planted in you. Look what's happening in my life. And all of a sudden, you start looking down on people that don't seem to be bearing the fruit you're bearing, and you get this kind of heart attitude, even if you don't express it. I would imagine Hagar expressed it because Sarah recognized it, because, you know, women just have that sixth sense. I saw how she looked at me. I saw it. 
So, say, well, look, Sarah, don't play. And so, here's the deal. So, my point is, it, it, you don't, don't ever allow this, it's very subtle, but don't allow the fruit that you bear in your life to be an occasion for you to despise or disesteem anyone else, especially those who are in authority over you. That's a very powerful word, and you need to take it to heart. Because it's very subtle, and we can all fall into that trap. And I believe the difference between Saul and David, if you remember my series on the, the one I taught after God's own heart, that there was a time when Saul had been little in his own eyes, and then that changed. But David remained little in his own eyes. I'd say it's a big deal. And so everything that's good about Hagar that I'm going to be talking about today, just don't forget this was wrong. What Hagar did here was wrong. And maybe if she had handled herself differently, particularly given that all of this whole scenario was actually Sarah's idea had she handled herself differently maybe she wouldn't have been cast out maybe we, we really can't approach the Bible with hypotheticals or what ifs or we don't know maybe Sarah, Sarah would have been jealous anyway but some of it was avoidable some of it was on Hagar she should never have despised Sarah or disesteemed Sarah so we agree all right let's read on so he went into oh I already read that let's go to verse Five, then Sarai said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. This is all your fault. All of it. Poor Abram. All he had said was, okay. <laughs> and now here she is berating Abram. This is all, all your fault. Every bit of this. From start to finish, your fault. My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. Boy, Sarah didn't think those words through because <laughs> the Lord judge between you and me, the Lord would have said, okay, Sarah, well, how did this all start, <laughs> right? But anyway, here's Sarah blaming it all on Abram. She's upset. And so Abram responds in verse six. So Abram said to Sarai, indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai had dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. And now we get into the first time when Hagar's out in the wilderness. She's an outcast for the first time. And we don't know exactly what Sarai said or did, but we know she was angry. She was upset. She was jealous. She was wrathful and vengeful, and she could have done anything. But if you look at the etymology, the, the, the root of the Hebrew word there, she really dealt harshly with her, probably in a way that was unjust, probably in a way, yes, Hagar did wrong, but Sar Sar Sarai's response, you kind of get the idea that Hagar did wrong on a 10 level and Sarai responded on a 500 to 1,000 level, okay? She treated her really bad and it was unjust because at the end of the day, even though Hagar mis mishandled, she really handled herself wrong, in a, it, wrongly, okay? She should not have dis disesteemed or despised her mistress. But really, all of this was kind of happening to her. These decisions were being made for her. At the end of the day, she was the, actually, you look it up, she was a slave. And, and so all of these decisions involving her were made for her. They didn't really check with her before they followed through with any of this. They just made these decisions. And now she's being punished for it. And so she gets sent out after Sarai dealt harshly with her and fled from her presence. And now we get to verse 7. So verse 7 says, now the angel of the Lord. Now, the, most Bibles have this angel capitalized. This is not Gabriel or Michael or anyone. It says the angel of the Lord. When it's capitalized, scholars tend to agree that this is often talk, this is usually talking about an appearance of the Lord himself, okay? And so you can see that throughout scripture, like when the angel of the Lord appeared to uh, Joshua, the one, I mean, all of these things, the one that was in the furnace, this is an appearance of the Lord. And the way we can verify that is later, Hagar says, have I seen him who sees me? He's the God who sees, and have I seen him who sees me? So she's referring to God, okay? So this angel of the Lord is a manifestation, somehow the presence of the Lord doesn't mean she's seeing his face. In fact, later when she makes the statement, have I here seen the one who's seen me? Uh, the, the, the wording, if you look, dig deep into the wording, she's saying, have I seen after or behind or the hind parts? Just like Moses would have seen God's back, it's not the same Hebrew word used, but 
you dig deep and it, it, it gives the idea in a connotation that she was looking from behind him. Which if that's true, she's in a place where she's been dealt harshly. Okay, they, Sarai dealt harshly with her. Sarai uh, uh, cast her out, okay? And so if she's seeing God from, from behind, she's seeing the, the, the rear view of the Lord, which that's what the, the, the original language indicates. Well, that means that like Moses, she would have seen his back. If that's true, she would have seen his back. Well, guess what? She would have seen the back that would one day bear even more unjust punishment and be treated even more harshly, okay? So she's seeing the Lord, and so this was the Lord that found her. And I wanna emphasize, this was not just a random angel. This was the Lord that went out to where she was, that went to find the outcast. And I want you to read how it's written here in verse seven. Now the angel of the Lord found her. Everybody say, found her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. Now, I'm gonna pause here for a moment and just talk about the God who goes out of his way to find the outcast. He found her, okay? She didn't find him. He found her in a desolate wilderness where no one else was looking for her. No one else knew to look for her out there. He went out to find her and found her. See, here's the Lord's heart for the outcast. And I'm gonna show you very quickly. We'll just pause Hagar's story and let me just give you a glimpse into God's heart for the outcast, the way the Lord will go out of his way to find you. And he doesn't ask you how you ended up there. He's not asking, well, now how did you get here? What, what got you in this situation? All he's interested in is finding you. To seek and save that which is lost. And so we see his heart for the outcast. If we could just put a pin in this and very quickly look at a, a, a New Testament example, John chapter nine. And this was a man who was cast out of a synagogue for believing on Jesus and this was for no fault of his own. Actually, he didn't do anything wrong. He was unjustly cast out of the synagogue, but this is John chapter nine. This, this young man had been blind. Jesus healed him at the Pool of Siloam. And then the parents were f- afraid to answer any questions because they didn't want to get cast out of the synagogue. So they said, our son's of age, just ask him what happened. And so in John 9, if you look at verse 34, actually in verse, well, we'll start for context in verse 32. The man who had been blind said, since the world began, it's been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And verse 34, they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. Now look at verse 35. Now again, the reason this guy was cast out was of no fault of his own. But again, here's the point. Jesus loves the outcast regardless of how you ended up being an outcast. So this guy's reason for being an outcast was very different from Hagar's reason. But Jesus is not analyzing the reasons of what made you an outcast. He's just interested in finding the outcast. Are you with me? So you might say, well, this is a very, very different situation. It is, but it's the same Lord doing the same thing. So look at verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, what did Jesus do? He went to find the outcast. Are you with me? He found him. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus does. So verse 35, Jesus heard they'd cast him out and when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the son of God? And verse 36 said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and is he who is talking with you? Of course, then it says, then he said, Lord, I believe. He fell down and worshiped him. But the point is, is that regardless of the reason of how this man became an outcast, Jesus went out to find, because we have a Lord who is drawn to seek out the outcast, no matter how you got there. And so the reason I want to emphasize this verse in verse 35, when Jesus heard, he heard that this man had become an outcast. He heard that they had cast him out and when he had found him. So remember, Hagar was cast out And what does it say? The Lord found her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water on the way to Shur. So again, the reason for being an outcast makes no difference to the Lord. All he's interested in is finding the outcast. 
Once he finds you, he's the one that seeks out. Now, this word, cast out, okay, when it says Jesus heard they'd cast him out, this is a very, 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 very strong Greek word. Very strong Greek word. Matter of fact, it's the first Greek word I ever learned when I was 11 years old. I remember a teaching a guy did. I was 11, Scott Holtz, and he was teaching. And I remember him talking about this Greek word. It's the word ekbalo. Ekbalo means thrust out, thrown out, cast out. Usually, many times, it, it, the connotation is done in a violent manner, done with violence involved, okay? And this word, the Greek word here, ekbalo, for cast out, it is the same Greek word used for when demons were cast out. Okay? So when the demons would be cast out, and actually it can also be translated driven out. Okay? So it's ekbalo, very strong. Cast out, thrust out, driven out. And in and, and connotation, it's often done with violence. Okay? So... It's the same Greek word anytime you see in the, in the New Testament about a demon being cast out. He cast out the demons, drove out the unclean spirits. It's always ekbalo. I can't say always, but it's, every time I've studied it out, it's been that Greek word ekbalo, okay? It's a very strong word. However, that exact Greek word of being thrust out, driven out, ekbalo, just the same word applied to casting out demons was applied to something that happened to Jesus, Actually, twice, but I'm gonna give you one. Luke chapter four. Look at Luke chapter four. And look at verse 28. I made reference to Luke four earlier after worship. It was where Jesus stood and read the Isaiah scroll about the spirit of the Lord's upon me, et cetera, et cetera. So in Luke chapter four, verse 28, Jesus had stirred up the hornet's nest. He'd made the religious people mad. He was very good at doing that. And so this was the result here, verse 28. So that all those in the synagogue, when they'd heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. So the beginning of verse 29, where it says they thrust him out of the city, that's the Greek word ekbalo, which is exactly the same word that's used for casting out a demon. It's very strong, very strong word. That's what happened to Jesus, and this was done with violence. You say, how do you know it was done with violence? Well, they were planning to throw him off a cliff. <laughs> so I don't know how you define violence, but that sounds like it qualifies for violence to me. And actually, this is right outside of Nazareth. In fact, Dora and I went to this precipice of where they were planning to throw him down. We saw Nazareth from a distance and, and, and went up in modern day Nazareth and that cliff is there and, and it's, the assumption is that it was at that spot because that is the highest point anywhere in the vicinity and we went there and it's terrifying. I mean, I've got a, the friend we went with, he's sort of a, a dare angel, if you will, because <laughs> I can you say daredevil in church? So anyway, he gets up right over the edge tempting the Lord anyway. That's, <laughs> that's between him and God. But it's, it's rough. And that's where they took Jesus to throw him down. It just so happens that what I was talking about earlier about the, the Arabs, there was a Palestinian family at that pre precipice with us. And they saw Dora and they saw her features and thought that she was a local. And so they came and started talking to, to Dora in Arabic. And then Dora said, I'm... <laughs> I'm Mexican. <laughs> nice try. So anyway, that's not what she said. But anyway, so they all came together. But by that time, the conversation had already begun. And they came, their family, their children. And we were all there. They said, can we take pictures? And they said, would you just come and have the afternoon in our house? We'd love to feed you. We'd love to have time with you. They wanted to spend time with us. We took pictures. And we said, well, we're with a group. We can't do it. Otherwise, we probably would have. They were very genuine. But that was the same place where, they were, where the, 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 the people of Nazareth were trying to throw Jesus off the precipice. And I was thinking, man, we're, here we are with a group of Arabs that people have this conception that, that they might be labeled terrorists, and I have to be careful here, but anyway, my point is, I just felt the love of Jesus with this family. They needed Jesus, and, and, but I felt Jesus' love for them. And so we were connected, and it was at the very place where Jesus himself had been cast out. Anyway, I think there's some... That was rich for me because Jesus was showing me, hey, I was cast out so that you could love the outcast. 
And, and, and so anyway, we were there at that precipice, but this is what happened to Jesus. He was, the, the, the Greek word, ekbalo. They literally thrust him out, Luke 4, 29. You know why that's a big deal? Again, same Greek word that's used for casting out, driving out demons. Jesus can relate to any outcast because he was cast out. See, we have a high priest. What does the Bible say in Hebrews 4 about we don't have a high priest who cannot relate, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He was touched in all points. He can relate. He had to be touched with everything. And so he knows what it's like to have ekbalo happen to him. Are you with me? And, and, and again, you might say, yeah, but it's, it's all different. He didn't do anything wrong and some people deserved it. Again, we are not talking about how you became an outcast. That is not what, when God finds you in your place of wherever he finds you, he's not finding you saying, how'd you get here? So I can know if I'm gonna help you or not. Or did you make your bed and now you gotta lie in it? No, that's not how our God works. He comes with his lifeline and says, I don't care how you got here, I'm getting you out. And so the point is, it doesn't matter the reason how you ended up an outcast. The point is, we serve a great high priest who knows what it's like to have been cast out to be an outcast. Are you connecting with this? Yes. All right. So, man, there's so much. It's, it's so rich. So, we'll continue forward, and, and I'll, I'll have more points to address on that later. I'm, I'm watching the clock. Don't worry. I didn't say I'm respecting the clock. I said I'm watching the clock. <laughs> Let's go back to Genesis 16, and we'll resume our story of Hagar. Genesis 16, is this okay for you guys? So verse seven, now the angel of the Lord found her. That's what he does for outcasts. He finds them. By a spring of water in the wilderness, by a spring on the way to Shur. And he said to Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? He did not say, how did you get here? Or what did you do to get, end up like this? He just said, where'd you come from and where are you going? That's all he said. So she said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Now I'm gonna read the next two verses and then we're gonna unpack them. Verse nine, then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so they shall not be counted for the multitude. Now, the first instruction he gives to Hagar here, if you go back to verse nine, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. A lot of people would take that as a rebuke from the Lord saying, hey, what are you doing, slave? Go back and submit to your mistress and, and do what you're supposed to do. But you know what actually the Lord was doing for her? Because the very next verse tells her the result of if she does what he's telling her to do. It says here, and, and it's not written in a conditional sense, but just read the context. It says in verse nine, return to your mistress, submit yourself under her hand, and then verse 10, then the angel of the Lord said, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly. I'm gonna bless you. Now watch this. God's instruction to Hagar to go back and submit herself to Sarai, you know what he was doing? He was actually giving her the answer, the pearl of truth. He was letting her in on a secret. This is how you're gonna end up being blessed. Now, I'm gonna show you what God was revealing to Hagar. Please don't miss this because for us, this sounds like normal doctrine, right? Love your enemies, do good to those who persecute. Did you know that that type of teaching was not given to those of old? Remember when Jesus was teaching in Matthew 5 and 6 and he said, you've heard it was said to those of old, right? An eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, hate your enemy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But I say to you, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you and spitefully use you. Do good to them, right? This is more elite, high-level truth. Are you with me? And this is the secret that God's letting Hagar in on. If you'll do this, blessing will happen. So he's actually favoring her by giving her the secret, okay? In other words, by dishonoring her, her mistress, she wound up in this situation, but God is telling her, look, here is a secret for you to see blessings start to happen. It doesn't even matter how Sarai responds to you. If you will honor her, if you will return, and not even, not, he didn't say go back in as Abram's second wife. No, go back and submit to her. <gasps> 
You know, Hagar could have said, oh, look, the wilderness isn't fun, but it's preferable. Which, listen, we don't know if, 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 if Sarai chastised her even with, in, a, in a corporal punishment way. And if her being pregnant, that would be very wrong, right? To do that to a pregnant lady. We don't know what went down. All we know is Hagar said, look, I don't know what's going to happen here, but I'm not interested in going there. Okay, but the Lord is giving her the key. If you will go back and honor her and submit to her, you'll see blessing happen, okay? Now, it's not written in a conditional way, but the first thing he tells her is go back. Go back to Sarai, go back to your mistress and submit to her hand. And then he goes on to say, I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna he doesn't say bless, but he says, I'm gonna multiply you exceedingly, right? So a blessing is spoken to her, but it's activated through doing these principles, this truth, okay, the blessing was given, but to activate it, he's giving her high-level truth that isn't really gonna be given until the New Testament. I want you to think through this with me. This is high-level stuff that Jesus said, look, I know what you heard said to those of old. Now listen to me and what I'm telling you now. You love your enemies. You bless those who persecute and spitefully use you. And then the Lord goes on to say, in verse 11, and the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael. You know what that means? God hears. Now she's about to call him God sees. But God says, I want you to name him God hears. We're already having our encounter with the God who sees and hears. Okay? She says, call him Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. He should be a wild man. Man, now listen, if the Lord ever tells you your, your boy's gonna be wild, I wouldn't know to say amen, rebuke. I don't know what to do to that, right? <laughs> this is your boy. You're blessed. I've, I have blessed you with a wild man, okay? He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man. Yep, that has happened. And every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. In other words, he's gonna continue to dwell among his brethren. I'm not gonna wipe his descendants out. Ishmael's gonna stay around because he's blessed. And yes, his hand will be against his brethren. Yes, that'll happen. But I'm not gonna wipe him out. He's gonna continue to dwell among them because he's blessed. Verse 13, then he called the name of, she rather, called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who, say it again, you are the God who? Sees. El Roy, you are the God who sees. This is very important. This is very key. She says, have I also here seen him who sees me? Some Bibles will give a, a note in the margin to say this could mean see the back of, even though the Hebrew word back is not used. Just in the, if you dig deep, it means seen the hind parts or seen behind or seen after, okay? She says, have I seen him who sees me? Therefore, the well was called Berlhairoi, observe it, for it is between Kadesh and and Berez, okay, Kadesh is, Kadesh Bernea, we're not gonna talk about the geographical locations, but in verse 14 it says, Berl Hairoi means the well of the one who lives and sees me. So verse 15, so Abram, Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 60, excuse me, 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. He's 86, you can kind of understand why he was getting antsy, okay? Lord, I mean, if you're gonna do something, Lord, it's, we're kind of in overtime. This is extra innings, Lord. This is, <laughs> so, I don't know how, how much longer we got at this. And so anyway, she goes back. She submits herself from, what, from everything we see. Ishmael's born. And you, we, we would love to, I could send you to lunch and we could all say, and they all lived happily ever after. Not true, right? They all lived ever after. Not exactly happily they're still living ever after. But I want you to join me now in Genesis 21. So in Genesis 21, Isaac is born. Throw a party. Okay, we know that God visited and we know the whole interaction all the way between Genesis 17 uh, and, and everything that God in his dealings with Abram, changing the name of Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah. So then Isaac's born in Genesis 21, circumcised in the eighth day, all right? And it's amazing. <laughs> Sarah laughed but she got mad when she saw Ishmael laugh, <laughs> right? Sarah laughed, but then Ishmael and, and, and Hagar laughed, and she's like, uh-uh, y'all y'all ain't, ain't laughing. I see no laughing matter, but Sarah was just laughing. Anyway, I'm not gonna go there. 
Genesis 21, so pick up in verse 8. So the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw, now we're now their new names, Abraham and Sarah. Verse 9, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. That word literally means laughing. In fact, it's a derivative of the same root of Isaac's name, laughter. Okay? And we don't even really know for sure. I mean, it says scoffing, but there's no guarantee that he was making fun of little baby Isaac. But Sarah took it personally. Now, you might say I'm speculating. I don't know what Ishmael laughed about. All I know is it was not the time to laugh. Right? Have you ever been in a situation where you're like, I'm, I can't laugh right now. I'm not supposed to laugh right now. I don't, please. Right? I, I see a meme where it's like the two guys is the same guy and it's like, this is me begging myself not to laugh at a non-laughing time. Right? And it just seems like it's harder not to laugh when you know you're not supposed to. Right? That is why I will never sit next to Sharon Jay at a funeral. <laughs> she's going to deal with me later. But I always love it because, see, I only mess with her when I got a mic and she's sitting down. <laughs> Otherwise, the fear of the Lord restrains me. But <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to deal with that. I'm, I'm going to pay for that. But we did have an issue one time where it was a funeral and it was not. It, it's, funerals aren't funny, but something funny did take place. And, uh, I happened to be sitting next to her and it was a long story. Anyway, here's the point. It's harder not to laugh when you know you're not supposed to. So Ishmael laughed. Whatever reason, whether he was mocking Isaac the way Sarah seemed to take personal or not, we don't know. But she said, that's it, we're done. And I honestly think she was probably on edge from the whole time Hagar came back. You can almost imagine. Look, this woman is on probation. And I'm telling you what, the first thing that was, if she so much as smirks, she's out. Right? And Abraham probably thought, I better comply or I'm out. We're, we're all out. And so, so this is what happened. Sarah saw him scoffing. And so verse 10, therefore she said, Abraham, cast out this bondwoman. Cast out this bondwoman. And remember, she'd given to Abraham as a, as a wife. So she's really belittling because, listen, once Sarah, and, and this is a big deal. This is also a violation of justice. Now, I don't want to, belittle what Hagar did wrong. But please listen. Once Sarah gave him to Abraham as a wife, well, then she was no longer to be treated as the status of slave. So when Sarah was continuing to treat her as slave after having already said, this is your wife, now I'm about to drop him. Don't, let me say something. We've been proclaimed the bride of Christ. Okay? And so if the enemy ever comes out and treats you as slave and you agree with him, you're wrong. Now, yes, we are bond servants by choice. We're servants, we're bond servants, but we are the bride. Okay? And so the bride is no longer to be treated as slave. And so please understand that Sarah herself, when she was Sarai, Sarai herself said, this is now your wife, Abram. I give her into your hand. And it doesn't even say, that's why I emphasized earlier, it doesn't even say that she became his concubine. Even a concubine is more of a slave level. But she said, this is, she was given to him as wife. The wife is not to be treated as slave. This is, this is a sticky situation, right? It's worse than a porcupine. So we've got, we, she is now his wife, and so Sarah is now treating the one that she proclaimed wife as slave. Are you with me? So don't ever let the enemy, and of course, this is only for the, this particular story because Sarah is not representative of the enemy. My point is, don't ever let the enemy or people treat you as though you're a slave when Jesus has said, you're my bride. Some of y'all just missed a chance to run down 85. Actually, some of y'all will run down 85 if I take too long with this, so let me continue. <clears throat> So she said, cast out this bondwoman. 
That's cast out this bond woman. Not the set for 007. That's cast another bond woman. But anyway, that's, that's so stupid. That's why I'm not a comedian. Cast out this bond woman. Now, Paul makes reference to this story in Galatians 4. So now we get to see this story rendered in the Greek language. Okay, go with me to Galatians 4, verse 30. And Paul's gonna reference this story in an allegorical way and granted he's applying it here different than the way I'm teaching it today and there's multiple applications. But Galatians chapter four and verse 30, Paul's talking about Sarah and Hagar and actually starting in verse 28, it says, now we brethren as Isaac was our children of the promise but as he was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit Even so it is now, verse 30. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Again, this is the story of of, of Sarah and Hagar, right? Are you with me? So what did Paul's referencing? What Sarah said, cast out this bondwoman. Well, this is the New Testament. The New Testament was written in Greek. That cast out, guess what word is the Greek word for cast out? Ekbalo, same Greek word. The same Greek word I referred to earlier about casting a demon out. That strong Greek word. But that's what I said, that's what happened to Jesus. He knows what it's like to be cast out. He knows how it feels to be an outcast. It doesn't matter how you got there. This is her second go at being an outcast. Sometimes the second is more painful than the first. Because you say, Lord, wait a minute, I came back, I submitted myself to her hand, just like you told me to do, and she didn't change. Listen, God never guarantees you that the other party's gonna change. I thought that if I did what you said, we'd get along. (laughs) No, not necessarily. It's not necessarily how it works. It says, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men, but there's no guarantee that the other party's gonna change at all. But you do what the Lord's directing you to do and that's how your blessing is activated. It doesn't make any difference what the other person's doing. Okay? So she's cast out a second time and it's ekbalo all over again. But we see here the, the Greek word, the strongest Greek word for cast out you can find, ekbalo, used twice about Jesus, okay? By the way, you know the other time it was used about Jesus? Mark chapter one where there was the reference about Jesus being driven into the, the wilderness by the Spirit. So, Matthew 4 says Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Luke's account also does. But Mark's account says he was driven into the wilderness to be tempted. Remember that lead us not to temptation? Jesus was led into the temptation so he could relate to you. He was driven out, even ekbalo, what the the Spirit did to him, showing that even at the cross, he was the outcast so you would be embraced as the son and daughter. But it it happened to him, he can relate. He knows what it's like to have ekbalo happen to him. So this is applied now specifically to Hagar. Let's go back to Genesis 21. Are you guys still okay? All right. Genesis 21. I'm keeping an eye on the clock. We only have six more chapters left. (laughs) Just kidding. All right, verse 10. Therefore, she said, to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight. Why? Because of his son, because of Ishmael, because he loved his son. But then in verse, now this is a, a, a good nugget here. Look at verse 12. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your, your seed shall be called. Now, Sarah tells him, cast out the bondwoman and her son. And verse, verse 11 says the matter was displeasing to Abraham because of his son. Actually, then in verse 12, God tells Abram, don't be displeased about this because of the son or the woman. See, what happened, it wasn't really just Ishmael. I believe Abraham had a, probably a soul tie to Hagar as well. It said because of the son and the woman. And I'm not gonna stay on that too long, but as we read on, God says in verse 12, whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. Now, if I'm Abraham at this point, I'll say, God, may I remind you? <laughs> we are in this predicament because I hated her voice a few chapters ago. Okay. I've already heeded her voice and look what has become of it. And here's God saying, listen to your wife. 
Now, Lord, I don't know if this is, if you're dealing with short-term memory failure, I don't know what's happening here, or I don't know if I'm just cursed, I don't know what's going on, but I listened to her once before, and we wound up in this situation, now you're asking me to listen to her again, it hasn't done well for me before, so how's it gonna work now? But see, here's the point. When God intended for this promise to be not just Abraham alone or Abram alone, when God changed their names, I don't have time to get off into all this, but the name of the Lord in Hebrew, Yahweh, Yud, He, Vav, He, okay? That He is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, okay? And and it, it depicts the grace of God. I don't have time to explain all this, but when God changed Abram's name to Abraham, he changed Sarai's name to Sarah, okay? In both Hebrew names, he added the letter He to Abram and the letter He to Sarai. It's even reflected in the English language. The letter H is added to both. The letter H there is the equivalent for what is in the Hebrew He. And the, the Lord's name has it twice. He breathed one into Abram and one into Sarai so it wouldn't be complete without the two of them together. They had to work together. It couldn't be Abraham and Hagar. It had to be Abraham and Sarah. And so God intended it that way. That's why our ministry name, Javan and Dorareg, we created Javareg because that's how it works. There's no ministry through me. Now, I'm complete in Christ already. You don't, your spouse doesn't complete you, but, and she's complete in Christ, but our ministry is us. And so the same way, Abraham and Sarah, one he from Yahweh's name is in Abram, one he from Yahweh's name is in Sarah, in Sarai, and they come together for the promise to happen. And God drew it up that way. And so then God says, listen to her. Man, I remember when I first got married and I was just trying to figure things out and I remember Elgin Young ministering to me and he said, brother, he's like, I've learned some things. He said, I believe you just need to listen to your wife. That was the spirit of God speaking through him. And I said, Elgin, look, here's the, here's the situation. No, I'm kidding. I said, Elgin, what, what, had, what had happened was, <laughs> no, I'm like, no I, listen, and, and he was absolutely right. And guess what? I've come, I saw an example just a couple weeks ago while we were in Colorado where I, listening to my wife was a big deal. Thank you, Jesus. And I, if, if I had not, I was close to doing something different and I chose to listen to her and thank you, Jesus, we averted a potential crisis because I listened to my wife. I don't mind telling you that. So, the point is, is that same thing, Abraham and Sarah, right? God, Abraham could have easily complained and said, look, I, I, look she, she's the one that got us in this situation. And God's saying, listen to her because the promise is not through you alone, Abram. It's not you and Hagar. It's not you and Keturah. not you and anyone else. It's you and Sarah. Listen to the wife I gave you. And so now we read on. Amen, that was free. Is that a good nugget? Go to verse 14. So Abraham, Abraham rose early in the morning, took a bread and a skin of water, putting it on his shoulder, gave it to her and the boy, gave, her, gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. And then she departed, wandered in the wilderness of Bathsheba, went back to the same wilderness. Abraham gives her a skin of water, be warmed and filled, and on your way you go. And can you imagine how this must have been? Now what am I gonna do? Me and my child, what, what are we gonna do? So verse 15, and the water in the skin was used up. See, whatever support you get from people is gonna be used up. But then she goes out, says, the water in the skin was used up. And let me just make sure I'm in the right verse here. This is in verse, oh, I skipped, I think. Yeah, so verse 14, so Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water, putting it on his shoulder. He gave it and the boy to Hagar, sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Bathsheba. The water in the skin was used up. She placed the boy under one of the shrubs. And then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot, for she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept, okay? She sat opposite him and lifted up her voice and wept. And then God heard the voice of the lad. What did God hear? He heard the voice of the lad. He loved Ishmael. And it says, then the angel of God called out to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what ails you? Fear not, for God has what? We see here the God who sees, the God who hears. Now I'm gonna wrap this up here in a moment and we'll, we'll just pick up next week because I wanna show you the implications of the God who sees and the God who hears, what that means for us. Because Jesus said, blessed are your eyes for they see, blessed are your ears for they hear. When you have an encounter with the God who sees and the God who hears, something happens to you. 
So we're about to wrap this up and I'll, I'll just continue next week. This wasn't supposed to be a two-part message, but y'all know me. So is that permission to continue? <laughs> <clears throat> everyone at the end of this who said that who said preach nobody wants to raise their hand nobody wants to admit it it came from over here I tell you when this message is over at 4 o'clock you can go over to them and you can do exactly what Sarah did Abraham. my wrong be upon you alright now I'm about to walk. Tell you the Lord still loves me even though I'm a goofball. All right, so we're going to continue here and I'll just finish out this, this section and then we'll wind it up. But it says here, I keep losing my place. We're in verse 17, 16, 17. Thank you. All right, so yeah, verse 16 is where she said, Let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat across and wept. Verse 17, and God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called the Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Now, you don't understand. Where the lad was crying is a place where no one else would have heard him. Are you with me? That's a place where no one else would have heard him cry. God's saying, I hear. I hear him right where he is. And again, God never asked you, how'd you end up here? Okay? Matter of fact, some of you guys will remember when I taught my series recently on abundant redemption. That was another one that I didn't get finished in one day and we came back and kept going. Abundant redemption. One of the things I taught was Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 4. If we could just flash Deuteronomy 30, verse 4 up. It makes a statement where God talks about even if you're cast out to the furthest corners under heaven from there. You guys remember when I taught that before? Some of you will. The words from there. I say from there. So Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 4 says, if any of you are driven out, now again, regardless of how it happened, however you were driven out, cast out, however you became an outcast, makes no, no, no difference. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there, everybody say from there. From there, the Lord your God will gather you, and from there, say it again, from there, he will bring you. So the from there is the indicator of wherever your life ended up that you didn't see yourself ever ending up there and you don't know how your life got there. Whatever mistake you made, whatever you did wrong, whatever path, sometimes it was something done to you and you were a victim of it and your life ended up there when you should have been way over there. Whatever your from there is, whether it was an addiction, some addiction, maybe substance abuse, drugs, porn, whatever it could be, okay, that you, you, you wound up in a place where you became desolate, lost everything, and you ended up in a there that you never saw your life ending up there. And see, this was a time under the law when God was telling people about, I'm gonna choose a city. He was talking in advance of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, but they didn't know where that place would be. He said, when you get to the land, I'm gonna pick a city, I'm gonna put my name on it, and that's where you're gonna come to me three times in a year, Pesach, Passover, Shavuot, Pentecost, and this week, which is tabernacles okay Sukkot those three times in a year he'd say come to me there in Jerusalem but when it came to their redemption and their rescue he didn't say you come to me for re redemption he said I'll get you from there I'm gonna find you because our God finds the outcasts there and he said if you're driven out to the farthest parts from under heaven. Now, the reason they were driven out was because of idolatry and spiritual harlotry and unfaithfulness to God, but whatever the reason, he has a heart for the outcast. And he said, if you're driven out to the farthest parts from under heaven, say, from there, the Lord your God will gather you and say, from there, he will bring you. He's not saying you have to come to me for, for your answer. I'll go get you. And so we go back to wrap up Hagar's story. We have landed our plane and we are now taxiing to the runway. And in just a minute, <laughs> you'll hear the ding and everybody will get up as fast as they can like in an airplane too. All right, so Genesis 21. Genesis 21, look again very quickly, look at verse 17. The, uh, God heard the voice, God heard the voice of the lad. Here we don't get any ambiguity. He doesn't say angel of God. Anybody says God heard. There. You'll never be in a place where you're, wherever you're there is, wherever you ended up, poor decisions, victimization, whatever happened to you, or whatever you did, you ended up there 
instead of where you should have been, God hears your cry there, even when no one else hears your cry. So it says, God heard the voice of the lad, and then the angel of God called out to Hagar under heaven and said to her, what ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard. God has heard. Everybody say, God has heard. Remember, we're dealing with Hagar's two encounters, the God who sees, the God who hears, the God who sees, the God who hears, even when no one else can see and no one else can hear. God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Say, where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him with your hand, and I'll make him a great nation. Now, verse 19 is where everything culminates for us today. You ready? What did God do for her? What does verse 19 say? You read it. What does it say? Then God who opened her eyes? And who was God to her? He was the God who the God who sees. She recognized him as the God who sees. Now there is a spiritual principle that I'll unpack next week. So don't miss next week. It was supposed to be today, but something went wrong. There's a spiritual principle that I'm gonna show you from scripture that any attribute of God that you recognize with your heart, it's only a matter of time before you start to reflect it in your own life. We know that when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, First John says. 3 verse 2, I believe. What about 2 Corinthians 3, 18, about we're beholding as in a mirror and we're transformed into the same image. When you see an attribute of him, and I, and I don't mean you just acknowledge it and somebody preaches at the church and you say amen. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking, you experience, you recognize an attribute of the Lord. It's only a matter of time before that attribute is reflected in your own life. She called him in Genesis 16 in her first encounter, the God who sees. All of a sudden her eyes are opened and she starts seeing. Are you with me? And so, then God opened her eyes. God opened her eyes. God says, who am I to you? Now let me reflect, let, let me cause that to manifest in you. Are you with me? You're the God who sees. And so she calls him the God who sees. Then he opened her eyes and she saw, everybody say she saw, a well. Woo. I feel like when Aki was singing, spring up a well, I almost got raptured. <laughs> she saw a well. Now, let me ask you this. Was the well put there in that moment? Did the well just happen to show up in that moment? No, the well was already there, but she wasn't seeing it. She wasn't seeing the answer, but the answer was already within her reach, even where she was. Because of the reach of redemption, because of the magnitude and scope of God's grace and redemption, you'll never get to a place where the answer is out of your reach. But you can be in a place where you're not seeing the answer. And so here we are. God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin of water, gave the lad a drink. She saw, but the answer was already there. Now, what do you do? You just have to say, look, I'm not seeing the answer right now, but I know I serve a God who sees. So I'm gonna trust by faith that my God who sees, sees an answer where I'm not seeing one. And sometimes your faith is just there. Lord, I don't see an answer. I can't identify the answer. But I'm gonna trust that my God who sees, sees the answer that's present that I don't see. The well was there all along. The, the well was within her reach. You will never get to a place. I don't care where you're from there is, where you ended up. That, what are you doing here? Where are you coming from? Where are you going? What, how'd you get here? God didn't even ask, how'd you get here? But she's in a here that should never have been. And here she is. She's an outcast, thrust out, driven out. She's here, but there was a well. And you'll never get to a place where the answer's out of your reach. God always, always, always positions. He even anticipates where you'll end up, no matter how you got there, whether you got yourself there with your own shenanigans or whether somebody else threw you out there or whatever happened, whether it was unjust, just, whatever, However you got there, he's gonna ensure that there's a well within your reach. And until you see it, trust that your God sees it. And he hears your cry. Because we serve a God who sees and a God who hears. We'll pick up there next week. Were you blessed?
hallelujah. Go ahead and stand up. I just tried to hand the service back over to my dad, and then <clears throat> you can imagine how awkward that felt. I did a double take. I thought, did we all miss the rapture? It couldn't be. But... So I'm going to call my wife up. If you can just bring one of the handhelds, I guess. Hallelujah. So before we do anything, I'm just going to say very quickly that if you don't know the Lord, he sees you, he hears you, but man, he wants to make you one who sees and hears. He said, blessed is your eyes for they see, blessed is your ears for they hear. We'll get to that next week. What happens in you when you encounter the God who sees and God who hears? But if you're not born again, if you're not in Christ, well, then you don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. Next week, I'll bring it up and I'll talk about it. But remember when Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know why he said that? Because he was activating and speaking to those that had the ears, but not everyone did. Only those who are in the kingdom have those ears and those eyes. And we'll deal with that next week. But man, if you're not in the kingdom, if you're not born again, today is your day. And so if there's anyone in here who has never received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I want to extend an invitation for you to do that. So anyone, if that's you, you can raise your hand. I, I didn't have anyone bow their heads or close their eyes or do any of that stuff, but there's no embarrassment. We, we love you. We're happy to have you in the family. So if that's you, please raise your hand. Or if you're watching online and you don't know Jesus, you're not part of this family. And I'm not talking about the church family. I'm talking about the family of the kingdom, the family of God. Today's your day. Today's the day of salvation. Man, no need to put it off. And so I would invite you, man, we're going to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus and, and welcome him to bring a brand new start into our life. And so I'm going to pray a prayer. And if that's you watching online or if you're here, you can pray this after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of salvation. I thank you that you are a God of covenant. And you have reconciled me to yourself. I want to be reconciled to you. Jesus, I commit my life to your hand. I surrender to your lordship. I call you my savior. I believe you died in my place. I believe you rose from the dead. And I believe that because of your redemptive work, I have newness of life in you. I'm part of your family now. I'm a new creation, and I belong to you. I have eyes to see, I have ears to hear, and I have a heart to perceive your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer you're watching online, please reach out to us at the number there that's provided or at our website, solidrockofatlanta.org. I want to welcome anyone that has any needs for prayer. We can have our prayer ministers come forward. And we're going to welcome anyone who has needs for prayer. And then I'm just going to let my wife wrap this up and close it out because I don't know how to close anything. I don't. I've never been good at closing. I don't clo I'm not a closer. You know, baseball teams have closers. I wouldn't be one. So I don't know how to close. She's for anyone who is here for the first time, we would love to get to know you more, to meet you. Please come through the double doors on the back of the sanctuary. We, we can't wait to meet you. And I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to pray for all of us to have and agree with God that we're going to have this blessed, amazing week. Thank you, Lord, for such a beautiful message, for such a powerful word that comes from you. Lord, I thank you that you will continue to reveal more of you to each one of us, Lord. You are the God who sees. You are the God who hears. Lord, if we have ever felt like we, nobody understands, nobody sees what we're going through, we can count on knowing that you see us, Lord. Not only do you see us, but you are the supply for every need in our lives, Lord. I pray that our eyes will be open to see the wells of su supply. 
that comes from your throne, that comes from your heart, Lord, that our eyes will be open and see, Lord, the abundance of your supply for every area of our, of our lives, Father, that we will see, Lord Jesus, what you see, that our eyes of our understanding will be open to see Jesus the way you do, to call those circumstances that are not as if they are, to call for life out of deadness, the dry bones to be alive again, Lord, because you, your word in us, your spirit in us, help us to see and recognize that we are in victory, that we walk over the, the storms, over the seas, of the, the circumstances, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for we are doers of your word, not only hearers, but we do your word. We do not forget it because we applied it in every area, in every circumstance lord because you are the god who who is so powerful and so abounding in love that what do you understand what is it to be cast out to be outside the camp lord so we can come and be part of your family we love you we magnify your name in jesus mighty name we pray amen hallelujah have a wonderful week we amen. love you we love you you're blessed